Everybody have a good week this week? Anybody have a rough week this week? All right. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I have had a rough week. I've had a rough week. It's been, I've had some disappointments. I've had some frustrations. I might have even gotten ticked off a time or two. Uh, uh, I came to church this morning pretty drained. Uh, if I was to be honest, I came to church very drained. Not, not, from, not from jet lag, just from garbage that sometimes tends to get thrown at us in our lives. And sometimes it feels like it just never stops. Anybody ever feel that way? Anybody ever feel like the garbage that gets thrown at you just never stops? Or maybe you got somebody you love so much and you see, you see them just, the hits never, ever stop coming. And so I'm going to be honest with you this morning. That was my week. And so we're going to start doing something that we do every week. But, but if you're one of those people who just had a great week this week and you are a prayer warrior, I'm going to encourage you, as I preach this morning, just start praying. If this means nothing to you, just pray because I'm... I really need a little bit extra get up and go this morning and maybe a little bit extra words because my week was full of stuff that took away the time to do this. But, but uh, let's, just, let's just bring it to God because that's what we do. We are vulnerable with each other and we are vulnerable with God. God, there were times this week I really wished you would have come through for me in a different way than you did. But I love you. God, I know that you are in control. I know that you are powerful and I know that you love me even when I don't get what I ask for. You love me even when I am down in the dumps. You love me when I feel like this, the hits just keep coming, God. You always love me, God. And so God, this morning, as I am going to try and put together what you've put on my heart, I just pray that you will come through and not me. I pray that, that if there is even, maybe it's just me who needs this message this morning. And if I pray that, that nobody else will fall asleep. And if there's one or two other people who need this message this morning, that you would help them hear it. And that your spirit would move and soften hearts, even if it's just mine. I love you, God. In your name, amen. I've titled my message this morning, Suicidal Anger. I don't know if any of you have ever realized how easy it is to allow bitterness and resentment and frustrations and anger into your life. I know that this week, given certain people in a private room where nobody would ever, ever find out what I did, I could have come to church with some scars on my knuckles. I know that in my own life, it is easy to allow anger, bitterness, resentment, and frustration to rule my, my day. That if it weren't for the fear of consequence, my life could be in a very different place this week. And, and I know that in my own life, and maybe you know that in your life as well. And, and as a matter of fact, it's kind of interesting, the passage that I had intended to speak on before I ever even left for Africa, I had planned that this Sunday we were going to talk about this passage. It kind of hit home, and I thought I'd think maybe God knew what I was going to preach on, or He told me what to preach on, and I thought it was my own clever planning. But uh, we're going to talk this morning about anger, and about hatred, and about rage, and about all those things that creep up into our lives without ever us meaning to. Before I left for Africa, we talked about the Beatitudes. We're going through, I call it the Red Letter Series. We're going through the words that Jesus spoke. And so we're going, we're going, through, we're going through Matthew, and we took, a, we took a break to go into John, but, but we've been in Matthew. We talked about the Beatitudes, about how it's important to confess our sin and to weep about our sin. And, and the next passage that we come to, from Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 20, and we're not going to read that, but that's where Jesus says, I have come to bring you a new covenant. He says, I haven't come to destroy the Old Testament covenant, but to fulfill it. And what that means is, he, he signs the contract so that you get a new contract. He signs on the dotted line so you get a new one. And he goes on to say, he says, if anybody changes even one little letter of the covenant, he's, he's at risk of judgment. And then for the next 
10 passages, Jesus goes on to change many, many letters of the covenant. And you say, well, he just said we're not allowed to change this covenant. But what he was saying was many of the Old Testament laws, if you were, were based on the true law. You see, in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, somebody comes to Jesus, a religious leader, they come to Jesus and they say to Jesus, they say, Jesus, what's the most important law in the entire covenant? And Jesus, looking at them, realizing that they don't get it, he says there is two. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Then he goes on to say all of those other laws... All of those other laws are actually just extensions of this one. And so a lot of those Old Testament laws and, and, and regulations were based on those. And so when he says, if you change anything of my law, he says, if you ever, he, what he's saying is, he's not saying you've got to keep sacrificing. He's not saying all those Old Testament laws that you can't eat pork still apply. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that if you ever take away from the law of love, you are in trouble. And if you don't believe me, recognize what he says in the verses that follow. And those are the verses that we are going to talk about this morning. He then goes on to give an example. In Matthew 5, 21 to 26, he says, for example, I said the for example, but he's giving an example. He says, for example, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And everyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister, I put in there without cause because some versions say without cause and some don't, and we're going to get into that, will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you were offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister is as something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid every last penny. Now I want to give you some clarification. Some of that seemed a little bit confusing, like, I've called my brother a fool before, and I'm a little bit worried that I'm now in danger of the, the, the fire of hell. And so I want to give you some clarification, because he's talking about the heart. He's not saying if you've ever called your brother a fool, get on your knees and, and beg, for repent, beg for forgiveness, because I'm probably going to call my brother a fool again. Um, many of you know some of my brothers. Um, ouch. I'm, I, mean, I might need to repent of that one, though. Um, and so let's go through a couple of things. Angry without cause. He's no, Jesus is not saying you can never get angry. Last week I kicked a table or a box across the room, representing a time when Jesus got a little bit frustrated. So clearly Jesus was not in danger of hell. But but when talked about angry without cause, and what I mean, what I believe he means about that is allowing bitterness to get into your life. You see, it's okay to get angry. But when you refuse to forgive, that anger no longer has cause. Anger without forgiveness no longer has cause, and, and, and so you, you're at risk of judgment. And when it says judgment, I do not believe he says if you get angry with somebody, you're going to go to hell. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that when we live according to the Holy Spirit, and you guys have heard me say this almost every Sunday, when you live and walk according to the Holy Spirit, you receive some things, love and joy and peace. And when you do not do what God asks, the judgment it's talking about is that those fruit will no longer be present in your life. You are not going to experience the love and the joy and peace that God has for you when you allow bitterness or anger without cause to come into your life. It says, if you say to your brother, Raka, well, what does that mean? I think I spelt it wrong, but that's okay. That word means worthless. You are not worthy of my love. You are not worthy of my forgiveness. I do not have to love you. See how this works. Everything that Jesus is saying is coming back to love, forgiveness, and reconciliation. That's what he's talking about. He's saying if you say you are not worthless, when, God, when I, as your God, has made you priceless, you tell somebody they are worthless, that they're not worthy of forgiveness, 
You are walking a fine line in your relationship with God and you will not be able to experience all that God has for you. If you call your brother a fool, again, I've been called a fool by my brother many a time. But what it's saying is that when you, when you fail to respect, when you fail to show people the love that God has said that they deserve because they are God's children. There are times where I've got family members where I don't think they deserve my respect. But I don't have to feel that way. Because I'm not respecting them for what they have done. I'm respecting them for what God has done. You see, when I give respect, it's not because of what you've done. It's because of what God has done for me. And if God's done it for me, I, I ought to apply it in my relationship with you. And when I look at you like you're a fool, you're not worthy of my respect because that's what you do to a fool. You withhold love from a fool because respect is part of love. And when I begin to not show respect because somebody doesn't deserve it, I'm walking a fine line with receiving the fruit of the Holy Spirit in my life. Because the Bible says that I don't get to do that. Because I'm a fool. There's a spot in the Bible where, where Paul says that God demonstrated his life, love when he came to save sinners of whom I am the worst. You might be a fool, but I don't get to treat you like one. Because I'm a fool. But God treats me with love. God treats me with respect. You see, this verse isn't about murder. This verse isn't about insulting your siblings. This, this verse is about the difference between love and hate. You see, the, the real law that God stands on is the law of love. Are you showing love to others? Are you showing love to God? And are you showing love to yourself? And if you do not show love, the opposite of love is hate. And I believe that this verse is saying we need to avoid breaking God's law of love and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference of love and hate this morning. Love forgives. Hate holds a grudge. If you're holding a grudge this morning, you are, you, you are, you, you are holding an element of hate in your hand. Sometimes, sometimes I, I have the characteristics of hate towards a person that I love. I, I, I love somebody, but, but I'm showing them hate because a grudge is showing hate. Love tries to see the heart of others. Hate focuses only on the hurt from others. Do you know what? Well, every time somebody does something bad or evil in this world, more often than not, there is brokenness in their own spirits. Love says, what made them broken? Hate says, how dare they hurt me? There's a huge difference between love and and hate and when you fail to look at what broke another person when you stop caring about why that person is broken you might say that you love them but you are you are revealing the characteristic of hate in the way you are responding to them love produces joy hate produces bitterness love and its fruit brings freedom and hate and its fruit brings bondage love forgive dis love forgives disappointment hate gets bitter or resentful. I want to say something this morning. You're allowed to get disappointed. You, you, you have the right to get disappointed without sinning. You're allowed to get frustrated. You're allowed to get upset. That's okay. As a matter of fact, you know, I, I've had people come to me and they've been upset or frustrated with God. And they're like, oh, I, I feel like I'm just such a horrible person because God disappointed me. God disappoints me all the time. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be true. I'm going to be vulnerable. God disappoints me. I get frustrated with God. Because I want stuff. Do you know what? When Dad died, I got frustrated with God. Not only did I get frustrated with Him, I let Him know. God. It's, I'm frustrated, but you know what? Frustration is okay. Disappointment is okay. God loves everyone. God got frustrated. God loves everyone. God can only love. And God got frustrated. God got upset. God got disappointed. And if God is the example of love, I'm allowed to do that. But God didn't hold a grudge. No, God didn't hold a grudge. God forgave. God didn't become bitter. No, God set people free. And so there is a very big difference between 
the disappointment that comes when you love and the bitterness that comes when you hate. And so I have a challenge for you. Are you a person who is, who is showing love or are you a person who is exhibiting hate in the way you treat other people? And it all comes down to forgiveness. But before that, I want to just say something. And this is not necessarily a theological point. This could be maybe, uh, you know, when you look at just the science of our, our, who we are, when you look at psychology, one of the things that they have, they have said over and over and over is that if, if you're going through a struggle and you go for counseling, do you know what they always do? They always try and figure out what the cause was. You're an angry person because so-and-so hurt you. I don't think you're angry because of that. I think there's probably a deeper cause. If, you, if you're struggling with an eating disorder and you go for counseling, you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, what caused this? What happened in your life that, you, that you're trying to beat yourself up, that you think that you're not worthy, that you're not good enough the way you are right now? Something might have happened. And you know what? When we look at just that, even in the secular world, it comes up over and over and over. Most people who live in any sort of bondage, who live in any sort of emotional crisis, who can't seem to get past a struggle in their life, who deal with, with these disorders, if you would, most of that can be traced back to a root cause. Something that they have not been able to set free in their life. You see, it comes to forgiveness. It comes back every single time that there's somebody in our life that we need to set free. I'm going to give you an exa- a couple examples of that. You know, there's people who, who I don't know if you ever met people like this, who, who get offended really quickly. They get offended really quickly. Or maybe you meet somebody in your life who, who you try and give them correction, and they get like, how dare you correct me? And you think, that person, that person's not they're, they're just angry all the time. But here's the thing. Let's go back to love. Love looks for the root cause. Love wants to know what hurt them. And how often do you look at that person and realize that when they were a child and they came home and they had a report card and they said, look, mom, or look, dad, here's my report card. And dad opens the report card and says, B plus? Really? B plus? Come on. What did you do wrong to get a B plus? What did you do wrong to get a B plus? You know what? That person, they hold on to that. They hold on to that scar inside of them for a long time. And you know what? You go to correct them, and they're like, how dare you correct me? Because it brings up an emotion. Or how about, about, you know, I know people that... I know people that if if you're you're in an argument with them, and they say something that you think is like, because they're really upset, you know? And you're like, and they make a really silly argument. And, and to them it's serious, but, but you just you have to chuckle that they're so upset, you know. And my dad chuckled a lot when people got upset. It was a bad habit. Uh, if I have a nervous laugh, I had somebody tell me that once before too. And, and so I laugh a little. If you laugh at this person, they're going to want to punch you in the face. Why? Because when they, were, when they were a child, maybe their family members mocked them when they got angry. And so you think they're just a bitter, upset, frustrated person. But no, they're living in bondage because they haven't yet been able to set, them, set that, that person free from the damage they did to them as a child. Oh, they love the person. It's their mom or their dad or their uncle. They love them. you got a person who's been, you got a person, and we talked about this already, there are people in this world who have been abused as, as young people. Maybe, maybe it's been sexually abused. And you know what? So often you look at these people and they're dealing with an eating disorder. They're punishing themselves. They're saying, this, this is ugly. This is no good. They're still hating themselves. They're living in bondage themselves because somebody else hurt them. And they don't love themselves. They're not worthy. They're not good enough. They need to have control over themselves now. And when you look at so many of these things in life, you realize it comes back to a chain that was put onto them years ago that they have not been able to release. It is characteristics of hate, even though they don't hate the person. They they, they resent, there's characteristics of hate that come out in their life that hold them in bondage forever. And they wonder why when they get into a confrontation with people that, that it escalates so quickly. It's because they are living in bondage that can only be released when they can forgive whoever needs to be forgiven. And I need to talk about forgiveness this morning. Forgiveness, 
One of the reasons that we don't forgive, one of the reasons that we don't live in freedom is because we don't understand forgiveness. So I want to tell you what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness does not mean accepting the action that hurt or negatively affected you. If somebody punches me in the face and I, for me to forgive them, I don't need to say what they did was good. I don't even need to say that, that there should be no consequences. If somebody, if somebody hurts my child, me forgiving them doesn't mean I'm not pressing charges. It means that I'm not going to live with hate and bitterness in my own heart for the rest of my life for what they have done. It means that I'm still going to pray that God is going to get a hold of their life and change them for the good. And that when God does get a hold of their life and changes them for the good, I don't sit there and resent them for the rest of my life. Because that's wrong. Forgiveness is not accepting what happened to you. Forgiveness is saying, I'm going to set you free. Because forgiveness has nothing to do with the other person. Forgiveness has nothing to do with the person who hurt you. It has everything to do with you. Because you know what? They're not living in bondage. You are. They're not affected. You say, well, yeah, they're affected. I'm giving them the silent treatment. If they're the type of person who's going to hurt you that bad, they don't care. Many times they actually love to see you still being in pain. Like you give them the silent treatment, they're feeling good about themselves. That's right. I hurt them. And I'm hurting them every day. That's why when you look, that's why when you look, they're, they're, they're actually murderers and, and rapists and stuff, people who are in prison who try and send letters to their victims just so that they can, in their own mind, relive their own evil knowing that that person is still suffering. You see, forgiveness has nothing to do with him. Forgiveness has everything to do with you. Forgiveness is about your response to hurt more than the hurt itself. Forgiveness does not mean putting yourself in a position to be hurt again. If somebody hurts my baby, they're, well, if, if I have the wherewithal to give them forgiveness like I should and not beat them down, which I probably would do, but if somebody were to hurt my baby, I'm being real, okay, guys? If somebody hurts my baby and you say, look, you're, I'm walking up to you and you say, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, I'll probably fail as a Christian. But the reality is this. If that were to happen, you wouldn't ever be with my child again. I might forgive you. I might pray for you. I might even pray that God bless you in your life. I might even rejoice when God changes your life around. But I am not going to trust you with my child. You see, forgiveness doesn't mean re-entering a position where you can be damaged and hurt again. Because remember, forgiveness isn't about them. It's about you. See, we always think forgiveness is about the person I'm forgiving. It has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with you. And so I forgive you. I'm not going to let you hurt me again. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that God restores you. I'm going to pray that God changes you. When I meet you on the street, I'm going to treat you. I'm going to treat you with love and respect even if I don't feel love and respect. Because it's about your actions. It's about your decisions. There are people in my life who have hurt me big time. When I see them, I'm like, how's it going? And I have to, I have to intentionally ask God every time for some people, God, show me why they're broken. Because unless I realize why they are broken, unless I want to know their brokenness, I will always hate them. So I have to say, God, what broke them? What was the moment in their life where they were abused? That I can weep for their brokenness instead of look at them and say, man, I don't care if I go to jail. Let's do this. You see, forgiveness, I'm going to say this over and over, forgiveness is about you, not about them. It's not about what they deserve, because if they got what they deserved, it probably wouldn't be forgiveness. Just like if I got what I deserved, it probably wouldn't be forgiveness. Because we don't get what we deserve. That's the beautiful thing about our faith. You may have to forgive somebody who did something hor uh, no, sorry, this is a, you may Forgiveness is an act of love for God. When I forgive, I forgive because I love the one who forgave me, not because I love the one who hurt me. And it is only through the power of the one who, lo who forgave me that I can ever even experience love again. Because on my own, I cannot love you. On my own, I can think of nothing more than to cave your face in. Not yours. No, not anybody in particular. But through the power of God, when I put my love in God, that's where my forgiveness comes from. 
Not only am I forgiven by God, I can forgive you through God. And there are three groups of people that we need to forgive. I believe that every one of us probably has a grudge against one of these three groups of people. And until we can recognize this, we're not going to be set free. But before I do that, it's not my notes, so I'm not even going to look at my notes. Before I do that, maybe you say, well, I, don't th I think I've forgiven everybody in my life. If you're dealing with a hang-up in your life, if you're dealing with an emotional struggle in your life, if you're dealing with a personality issue where you keep offending people or you keep getting into fights, you probably have to forgive somebody. You just don't realize who it is. And one of the ways that you can figure out who you need to forgive is begin to pray about your own problems and say, God, show me the root of this problem. Show me what the root of my anger is. And I, I can bet you almost anything, as you begin to pray, God's going to put a moment in your life, it's going to jump into your head. And you're going to go, what? That's right. I have heard of people who are addicted to pornography who find out that their addiction, as they pray to God, they realize that, that was ba the root of that cause had nothing to do with pornography. It had to do with an anger towards their father or an anger towards their mother. And somehow when they release this, it set them free from a different problem because we don't always see the root of those problems, but you need to pray and say, God, show me. And so if you think you're, this message has nothing to do with you, ask yourself, do I, do I take correction well? If you don't, maybe it's because somebody's hurt you. Ask yourself, am I dealing with issues over and over? Do I have a chronic issue that always happens? Am I that kind of person who, I think I got no problem, but everybody always gets offended at me? You probably have a problem. You know those people that, I got no problems. I'm perfect. But they're always in a fight? Maybe if you're always in a fight, you need to say, God, why am I always in a fight? Because <laughs> it's probably, there's probably a problem you need to deal with. And God's going to probably reveal to you one of these three people. Number one. A person or a group who hurt you. That's a simple one. That's the one we all know. Somebody has hurt you, you need to forgive them. Everybody has been hurt, and as long as we refuse to let it go, we will always live in bondage to them. They have us in bondage because we haven't forgiven them. Their actions will forever control our lives while making no difference in theirs. I'm going to give some examples, just, just for argument's sake. You may have a grudge against the church, how many people in our world have failed to come to Christ who are proudly believers of God? I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ. I am just not going to get, I am not going to ever come to the front of a church and give my life to Jesus Christ. Not because I don't believe in Jesus, but because the church has been a real jerk. Do you know what the church did to me? And jerk is a nice way of putting it. That's the nice way of putting it. And the church has hurt me. I am never going to be vulnerable again. I am never, ever going to be vulnerable. I, I'm going to follow God. I've got nothing to do with the church. You know what that is? That's unforgiveness. Hate has got a hold of you. Hate has got a hold of you. And you think that just because you're following God, but you want to have nothing to do with the church, you want to have no commitment to the church, it, you know what it is? Is that you have not forgiven the church. And unforgiveness is a product of hate. And you are resembling a hatred towards the church. Now, maybe those people aren't here this morning because they hate the church. But maybe you know somebody who's dealing with that. Maybe you need to forgive a family member who has hurt you emotionally. I believe that a lot of us have been holding on to hurt from our parents or our aunts or our uncles or even a bully in school, but, but often a family member. And we don't even realize it. And we think, well, no, I've gotten over it. I've gotten over it. Have you? Have you gotten over it? If you have gotten over it, there should have been a positive change in your life the moment you got over that. If there hasn't been a positive change in your life, you probably hasn't, haven't gotten over it. You may have to forgive someone who did something horrible to you or somebody that you love. It is hard to forgive horrible people. It is hard to forgive a horrible person but you're not setting them free. You're setting you free. You are not releasing them from consequence. You are releasing yourself from the consequence that is that you will, that the consequence of not experiencing what God has for you, the love and the joy and the peace. When you forgive a horrible person, you are setting yourself free. And so you need to do it. You need to say, God, 
I want to set them free. And the first way that you can set them free, the first tool to set free a horrible person is to start, begin to pray that God gets a hold of their life. That is an act of forgiveness. That's an act of forgiveness. Because when you pray that God gets a hold of their life, you're no longer praying revenge on them. You're praying that God will, 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 will change them, that God will shake them, that that rapist, that God is going to change him, that he will be a broken man because of the grace of God. And you may still want to punch him in the face. But at, but, but at least when you begin to pray that God can get a hold of his life, that is a prayer of love. And you may feel like it's a prayer of revenge when you're praying, God, like, but at least it is, it is a step towards love. Because when we pray that God will change people for the better, that God will break the evil in people, at least it's still a prayer of love. And so if you don't know how to set somebody free, begin to pray that God will get a hold of them. Because you know what? You pray that for a year, two years, three years, four years, and on that moment when God gets a hold of the rapist, the murderer, the abuser in your life, when God gets a hold of them, you're going to go, oh my word, God answered my prayers. And it's going to be pretty hard to hold on to that bitterness and that hatred when this person is crying and on their knees begging forgiveness, saying, how horrible was I? But you've already forgiven them because it starts with praying a prayer of blessing on them that says, God, get a hold of their life and set them free. That father who treated you like utter garbage and you say, God, and he, he might be a Christian, but he, he, he ain't free. God does not have a hold. There are a lot of men who go to church every single Sunday who God does not have a hold of their life. And if that's your father, your uncle, your grandfather, do you know what you need to do? Pray that God gets a hold of their life. Pray that it is no longer their religion that draws them to church, but their brokenness. And begin to pray for the abuser in your life and say, God, get a hold of them. I still want nothing to do with them, but I want you to get a hold of them. Because when there is an abuser in my life, I want to have nothing to do with them until God has gotten a hold of them, until God has changed them. You don't have to pray that God's going to make you want to hang out with them. If somebody hurts my baby, I will not want to hang out with them. But you can pray that God is going to get a hold of their life. And when God finally does, maybe in that moment, God is going to restore your faith in that person. But your faith in somebody is different than your forgiveness towards them. I'm getting really carried away. I don't even know where my notes are. So you may have to forgive somebody who hurt you. Number two, I'm just going to leave that. Number two, some of us need to forgive God. And a lot of you don't like to hear that. Maybe some of you who've been in church your whole life, when somebody tells you you need to forgive God, you get offended that a pastor might say that we need to forgive God. God hasn't done anything wrong. God is perfect. God doesn't make mistakes. Maybe not. But I'll tell you something, I have had to forgive him before. Because God has offended me. He wasn't wrong, but I still got offended. God has ticked me off. And those are the nice ways of saying it. I have been furious at God. And it was okay until I let bitterness and resentment towards God come into my life. I had a friend when I was 16 years old. One of the greatest men, as a 16-year-old, I thought he was the greatest man on the face of the planet. This guy worked at camp every summer. He got a job. He'd take, like, work at a gas station all, 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 all winter long for the sole purpose of just being able to stay alive so that he could serve at camp all summer. And I thought, man, when I looked at that, when I was a kid, he was like, Rick, God's going to use you to do great things, not tomorrow, but today. And I thought, man, who, who could be greater than this man who believes that I have a role in God's kingdom? And he, he calls me up one day. He says, hey, I just want to let you know that God's, God loves you and I just think you're an awesome guy. Three days later, he died. Just got a, got a flu and just like a, like a heart infection and died. And the words that I used towards God were probably not appropriate. But you know what? God can handle it. And maybe not everybody likes what I'm saying here, but God can handle it. But the moment you let bitterness towards God come in, you've got to confess those. But God, but remember... Is forgiveness about their failure? No. Forgiveness is about me setting people free. Forgiveness is about me setting... God didn't do anything wrong. God did not fail. But that doesn't mean I don't have bitterness. And if I have bitterness, forgiveness is about me dealing with my problems, my bitterness, my resentment. And so even though God has done nothing wrong to me, I might still be bitter against Him. 
And there are a lot of people in this world, and you might be one of them, who has not been able to forgive God for something horrible that happened in your life. Maybe you've traveled the world and seen little kids starving, babies dying of AIDS who've never done anything wrong, and you look at God and you say, God, how could you allow this to happen? And you become bitter with God. You might need to forgive him. How weird is it forgiving God? God, I am setting you free. I realize that you are perfect. And you've hurt me. And I don't understand you. You've confused me, God. I'm confused. But God, I do not want to be bitter at you. And I think there's a lot of people dealing with a lot of garbage in their life right now because they're holding a grudge against a perfect God. Because the truth is that God does hurt me. Not on purpose. God doesn't do this. God hasn't failed me. But I didn't want, I didn't want my dad to die. I didn't want that to happen. And d- does God have all power? Yes, he does. Therefore, God could have literally reached out a spiritual hand or even a huge physical hand if he wanted. There could have been a literal hand reached down from heaven, grab that plane and put it down on the ground nicely. That could have happened. So because it didn't, I allowed a little bit of bitterness to come into my life. It was okay that I was disappointed. Disappointment is okay. Bitterness is not. Some of us need to forgive God. It's not okay to allow that disappointment to turn into resentment, bitterness, or unfaithfulness. We need to commit ourselves to fully put our faith and trust in God, who we do not always fully understand. God never fails, and God never does anything wrong. But that does not mean that I don't sometimes blame Him for the pain of my life. And this is maybe this is where I'm preaching to myself. That does not mean we are not hurt, confused, or offended by God's decisions. We need to express these things to God and forgive Him. Until you say, God, I'm hurting. I don't get it. It'll be hard to forgive. Forgiveness is about us changing, not God changing. We also must repent. So we are allowed to express our frustration. But if that frustration turns into bitterness, unfaithfulness, or resentment, then we need to repent and confess that to God. When we fail to forgive, we fail to experience freedom and the rewards of walking in unity with God. We fail to trust, obey, or fully commit to God because of that distrust. How do you know if you're bitter against God? How do you know if your disappointment has turned into spiritual resentment against God? You know it when you fail to trust God's word. When you begin to insert your own opinion over the, over the words of Scripture, you no longer trust God. You no longer respect God. And so God tells you this is truth, and you say, I'm not into that. I don't buy that. Maybe when you begin to stop looking to God in the face of your problems. You know, there's a lot of people who look for their own inner peace. I'm just going to look for my own inner peace. I'm going to look to my inner self. And that sounds good. It sounds beautiful. But you know what it really is? It's resentment against God. We need to trust that God is going to pull through. We need to trust that although He can confuse us at times, that He is the Creator of all and that God is love. And when you fail to turn to God in the midst of your problems, it might be because you've got a problem with God. And until you can fix that problem with God, you are never going to fully know God's joy and peace. And so you're always going to have to go into your inner self because you haven't gone to God, because you've put up a barrier. And many of us have to come to God and say, God, you disappointed me when my dad died or my uncle died or when you allowed me to be sexually abused or when you allowed me to be physically abused. God, you disappointed me. And I allowed that to become bitterness. And God, first of all, I want to set you free. God's already free, but but we're we're setting ourselves free by doing this. We say, God, I forgive you. I know it's not your fault, but I forgive you anyways. Sometimes, sometimes there's freedom in forgiving. And it sounds odd. But when we look at David, and I'm not going to read the passages for you this morning, but David, a man after God's own heart, most of what he talked about in Psalms was, God, I'm upset. David was upset with God all the time. All the time. If you read the book of Psalms, read the book of Psalms one day, begin to read through it, and you're like, God, where are you? God, you've abandoned me. God, you've forsaken I mean, Jesus, God, you've forsaken me. That sounds a little bit like disappointment. It's okay. And then as David began to say, God, I love you. God, I love you. That was, God, that was David forgiving God. Because he, David was recognizing that God was not at fault. 
But David had a grudge, so David had to release it. And I know the word forgiveness and releasing is, is difficult to understand, and I hope you guys are getting what I'm trying to put out there. But it's okay to be hurt. You do not look to God in trouble, but rather look to your inner self. You don't trust God to be what you need. You worry or fear everything. If you are always living in fear, you're always worried about everything, it might be because you've, you, you don't actually love God enough to trust Him. And that might be something you need to confess to God. You're not a bad person when you confess something to God. When you're angry with God, you're, 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 you're disappointed. You're not a bad person. You're a person with an emotion that God gave you. But you need to take hold of that and say, God, I love you. Even though I'm hurt that you didn't save somebody that I love, even though I'm hurt that I, had to go through, that I went through an abuse, God, I, I still love you. It's a form of setting yourself free by setting him free. And finally this morning, some of us need to forgive ourselves. There are some of us who are hurting deeply. There are some of us who are holding a grudge against ourselves. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I think he'd be fine with it, so I'm going to say it. When dad died, when my dad died, my, my, my brother felt horrible. On the day that dad died, I, 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 hopefully I don't get in trouble with this one, but for the day that dad died, it was my dad's first solo flight. If you guys, most of you probably know obviously what happened, but it was my dad's first solo flight. And Kevin felt like he had more, a little bit more training than dad did. He felt like he had a little bit better grasp. And so Kevin felt like he wanted to go with dad on dad's first flight. And dad didn't really, dad wanted to do it by himself because that's who dad was. Dad wanted to fly over and be like, that's right, I did it, I got it. That's who dad was. And so when my brothers show up, not going out with my dad on that flight, that was tough. Would it have happened if I was in the plane with him? Would it have happened if I was there with my hands on the second wheel? Would it have happened? And it's easy to feel pain in our own spirits when, 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 when we, we, something happens and we feel like we could have stopped it. Am I responsible? And if we do not set ourselves free, if we do not forgive ourselves, because I want to tell you something, my brother has zero responsibility in what happened to my father. Well, well, would, would, would the crash not have happened? Who knows? That's not the point. He has zero responsibility. He is completely free, but that does not mean he doesn't have to forgive himself. That doesn't mean that, that we don't have to forgive ourselves with zero responsibility, and maybe somebody in your life has been hurt, and you feel like you could have stopped it. Forgive yourself. Set yourself free. It is not your responsibility to hold on to that. It is your responsibility to live in the grace of an incredible Savior. That is your responsibility. Your responsibility is to live in freedom. Maybe, maybe you got yourself into a situation where you got hurt, Maybe you did something horrible. Maybe you lived a lifestyle that you were horrifically ashamed of. Do you know what? You may be living in spiritual and emotional bondage this morning. You may have never been able to have a healthy relationship after that time because you haven't forgiven somebody. You haven't set yourself free. You are living in bondage because you haven't forgiven yourself. How often do we have people who have been, who have been, and, I, and I, I pick on this one because I've been studying it a little bit, who have been sexually abused, who get into prostitution. Why? Because they haven't forgiven themselves. They think that's all they're worthy of. And you know what? They never love God again. Why? Because they haven't forgiven God for allowing that to happen. And they don't forgive themselves. They don't forgive themselves because they say, how could I get myself into that situation? How could I have gotten myself into that horrible situation? Who cares? Forgive yourself. Let yourself go and say, God, I need you. I need you, God. God, restore me. God, restore me. It's easy to pray, God, get a hold of that person. But sometimes we need to say, God, set me free. I'm no longer responsible for what I did yesterday. I've already given it to God. I have already given it to God. At this point, I'm responsible for what I do today. 
Yeah, there might still be consequences for yesterday. And you still have to live up to those consequences. But you have been forgiven. Live forgiven. And until you live forgiven, you're never going to have a healthy relationship with other people. Until you live forgiven. And God's already forgiven you. You're the only one who has to forgive yourself at this point. At this point, it's on you. And until you can forgive yourself, you are never going to experience freedom. How many parents in this world, how many, and this is a big one, and, may, and I'm going to be honest with you guys, some of you may need to share this with your friends who didn't show up to church this morning, or who go to a different church this morning. How many people in our world are living in guilt because their kid did something bad? Did I fail? I must have failed. I'm a failure. This and that and the other. It is not on you. It is not on you anymore. The Bible says that you need to forgive and that forgiveness extends to yourself. What's done is done. It is now your job to extend love, to extend love to other people. But how could you ever forgive somebody while you are holding on to your own pain? How can you ever forgive somebody while you're holding on to guilt that's not yours to hold on to? We have a God who can set you free. And freedom comes with forgiveness. And He has taken your guilt. Did you fail as a parent? Maybe you did. Jesus took that for you. He took that for you. Be free. Did you fail in your life? Yeah, you maybe did. Live in freedom because Jesus took that for you. That's what the cross was. It wasn't just Him forgiving you. It was Him taking that guilt that you have upon Himself. When He said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? He wasn't talking about the pain. He was talking about experiencing your guilt in that moment. When He was on the cross and He experienced what you are feeling right now, the only thing He could say is, God, where did you go? Because you're feeling forsaken by God, know that He already felt that for you on the cross. It wasn't the pain that made Him cry out. It was what you are feeling when you take your own guilt upon yourself. God wants to set you free. But you've got to set yourself free. You need to accept the forgiveness. I'm going to invite the worship team forward because my notes are useless at this point. I want to ask the worship team to come forward. But i got a challenge for you as they do. Are you, are you living with murder in your heart per se? Are you living with a suicidal anger towards yourself or towards other people? Are you being destroyed because your father treated you like garbage when you were a kid? Are you being destroyed internally because the church was a complete and utter to you when you were younger or in another part of your life? Are you, are you living in bondage because your kids did something stupid? Are you living in bondage because you did some horrible evil things in your life? It's not your place. You've got one role this morning, and that is to live in the freedom of forgiveness. When Jesus talked about murder, he was talking about forgiveness. He was talking about love, and you deserve love. You deserve to be loved and to experience love. That is what you deserve, because when he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? He took your shame. He didn't just take your sin. He took the results of your sin. He took your shame. He took your, your guilt. He took your unworthiness. And he said, from this moment forward, you are priceless. And if anybody says, Raka, if anybody says you are worthless, they are guilty and at risk of judgment because in the eyes of God, you are priceless. And so we're going to have a prayer team come to the front this morning. And, and, and you can come if you've got sickness. You don't just have to come if it applies to what I preached this morning. But if you're here this morning and you're ticked off at God, just tell Him. I've yelled at God before. I've yelled at Him. And when I came to Him in the midst of that, no joke, I remember being in my car. It was my little red car. My friend died and I am screaming. I am lit. I thought the airbags, I didn't, if, I, if the airbags could go off from what you're doing to the, to the, to the front, to the steering wheel, that airbag would have gone off. I'm surprised I didn't break through that steering wheel. 
I'm in that car parked and I am literally pounding with my fist into that thing. To God, where are you? How the bleep could you allow this to happen? And it's okay. Because God loves you. And God's like, you don't have to feel that way anymore. I love you. And I'm not a horrible person for beating the steering wheel, being upset with God. God's big. God's a big, big God. And sometimes we need to come to God and say, God, I'm broken. God, I need you to fix me. I'm so broken inside, I don't know how I can go on. And that's why we come to church. We don't come to church because we're perfect. We come to church because we're busted. And if you need to be fixed this morning, come and pray with somebody. If you need to experience forgiveness of yourself, pray with somebody. And ask God. If you're angry with yourself, ask God. Say, God, let me see this morning in myself what you already see in me. Give me an image of who I am in your presence. And I believe that when we bring our unforgiveness, our brokenness, our rage, when we bring it to him, not with guilt, but with brokenness, we will be set free. Don't allow yourself to commit emotional and spiritual suicide because of anger and rage. God, show me what I need this morning. Show me who I need to forgive. And God, help me to forgive you if I'm holding a grudge. Because I love you with my whole heart. And I only want to show emotions of love towards you. And even though I am sometimes disappointed when you don't do what I want you to do, I love you, God. Help me experience that love this morning. God, if there's anybody who needs to pray that prayer with me this morning, just help them to have the courage to bring it to you. You are holy, you are powerful, and you have shoulders that are big enough to handle anything I throw at you because you are love, and you take it with love. God, I need you this morning, and I bring it to you. Amen. Let's go into a time of prayer this morning and bring it all to God. Please don't leave. If you have to go out and have a break, come back in. We're going to do announcements afterwards, but let's bring it to God. Let's worship God this morning.